And may that be so that you know, this morning we just have a greater a greater awareness of his presence because it's it's true, it's so. He's he is present. And, and he's always present. And so whatever whatever you're doing, just aware that God is with you and walks with you, just aware of his presence and you know, the glory of his goodness because he is good and we need to have more than just a uh, intellectual connection with God. We need to have a experiential. We need to have an emotional. And that's what's missing sometimes. In any good relationship, there, there's an emotional component. Not that emotions rule the relationship, but it's certainly there. And if it's, if it's not there, uh, something to be said about that relationship. But anyway, keeping that in mind. A few years ago, uh, I wasn't here very, very long as somebody had told uh, leaders working with the youth came and said, hey, do you have any, do you have an idea uh, for the next study that we're going to be doing? And, and I thought, and there was this uh, book, and it was by a guy named Andy Stanley, who pastors in just a little north of Atlanta. And his book was called The Seven Checkpoints. And here's the subtitle. The subtitle for that book is Seven Principles Every Teenager Needs to Know. And if we were to put our heads together, we would probably have more than just seven. But there, there are things, right? There are things that, as teenagers, as they get older and they go out into the, uh, into the adult world, you know, even as even as a high school student, but but more so and more so, there are at least seven things, according to this book, that you you absolutely need to know. And I guess looking at that book and going through it, and I thought, well. These seven principles, they're good for teenagers, but they're good, it's good for adults. And I'm thinking, it's, it's, it's good for me. And I'm not so sure that, that even the adult population uh, live, lives this stuff out. And so, uh, and, and you know we can't pass on to teens or anyone that which we're not currently living. Any more than a thief should tell someone not to steal. You know, it just falls on deaf ears and... Who do you think you are telling me to do what you're not even doing? And there's an in integrity issue with all that. And so what one thought is when it comes to show and tell, it's more important to show than it is to tell. And we need to be living what we're saying, and we can never do it fully, uh, but moving in that direction. So let's live what we're, what we're telling others. Let's instead of telling our kids what to do, it's okay, but are, are you living as well? Is that where you're at? And if not, you know, get there. So these seven checkpoints is what I actually call the seven essentials. Uh, so we bring in this new series on, on the seven essentials that I go in order to live well. Not, not to be a good Christian versus a bad Christian or a obedient Christian versus a disobedient Christian. It's not so much that but what it, what it requires to live well, uh, for anyone, for everyone to live well. And I go, and once, once we begin to live well, I, at that point we can pass it along to people that are important to us, whether it's your kids or your grandkids or, or someone who's not living well, whether they're in the church or outside the church, to begin the conversation. And, but let's, let's start by our own lives, instead of just you know, talking and assuming that, that we're there already. So the beginning one of the of these seven essentials to live well is, is authentic faith. Uh, the Bible talks about faith over and over and over and over. You know, you were saved by faith. If you were in Christ, if you were born again, that was a faith experience. That was a faith issue where you put your trust in, in Jesus Christ. You saw your sin issue. You understood the cross and you asked him for forgiveness, and, and you did a great work there. But faith is not a one and done issue. It's a once and always issue. It's an all the time thing. And so the question to ask ourselves, how am I living by faith now? And, and if I'm not living by faith now, uh, there's something to be said about how you're living. Maybe you're not living as well as you thought. How are you living by faith today? We're glad you put your faith in Christ. We're glad you were born. We're glad for that. But if you were saved by faith, we are also to live by faith. So it should be a current issue. And so what happened at salvation should be, should be going on. And you didn't know what, what, all, 
what salvation was going to do totally. You didn't know where it was going to take you. You didn't know how it was going to change your life, but you know it did. And so this faith should be happening constantly. So first, the number one thing to talk about faith is the thing about defining faith. What is this? And the reason I think this is so important because we may get part of it right, but I've seen, and you've probably seen it as well, where people get off on what they thought was faith or biblical faith, and it really wasn't. And it, it can serve to, to shipwreck faith. It can serve to uh, no longer follow God. I, I thought, I thought, and, and I put my faith, and I believed, and something didn't happen, and therefore, boom. You know, I think we all know of people who used to come to church. Maybe not this church, but they used to go to church. And they used to talk about Jesus. And they used, they used to do these things. And they used to serve. They used to, they used to. And then the question is, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. At some point, they had a crisis of faith. And so, that's good for you, but been there, done that. I'm not doing it again. And that shouldn't be, and hopefully... Uh, that'll never happen to, to us. So anyway, defining what faith is so we don't get to a place where crisis mode kicks in. So in, in this, here's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says this, now faith, this is faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of, the, of things not seen. Now that can be a, a confusing statement. The assurance of things hoped for. Well, how can I be sure of what I hope for? How can I be convicted of something that I can't say? And so it, it just seems to go, I, I don't get it. I kind of get it, but I don't get it. Well, let's move on. No, let's understand this. It's the assurance of faith so forth. The assurance of faith. Faith, is, come with this. faith is an action, but faith also needs a, what's called an, an object. There's no such thing as biblical blind faith. Christianity is not about blind faith. There, there should never be this thing called blind faith. There's faith, but not blind faith. So, the, the action is trust. That's what faith is. The object is Christ. So when it comes to faith, it's I'm trusting in Christ. That's, that's faith. Uh, don't make it much more than that. But the Bible uses this word believe a lot. To believe and to believe and believe. Um, in, the, in the Greek text, the, the word faith and the word believe is the, is the same word. Or, or faith is, is the, uh, the subject or it's uh, yeah, the, 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 the noun. The word believe is, is the verb. But it's the, the same word. So don't think it's, it's different than it, it's not. It's the exact same thing. So if this is faith, is, is trusting in Christ. So trusting in Christ gives you a future certainty of things which we, we can't uh, only hope for, things we can, cannot presently see physically, but we can see it spiritually. I go, faith, we, we're blinded by our physical eyes, but it's 2020, it's clear in, in our spiritual eyes. Now, it's easy to get confused about faith and make it what it isn't, and that's where we get off. So I want to say, faith, faith is not. This is what it isn't. This is where we get in trouble, and this is where your faith can be shipwrecked. Faith is not a power that moves God in the direction we desire. That is, we want it bad enough. If we can just convince ourselves that it's true, that it will happen, it will. It's not that. Faith is not a code that unlocks the door to God's unlimited resources. God has a lot of what we want. God loves to give. He's all-powerful. He can do it. God loves to give. All it takes is faith for the transaction to take place. So let me figure out what the code is, how I can gain access, and as long as I, I put in 
the code, you know, that is the key, the combination, and now we can have what we really, really want. And it's easy to convince ourselves that it's going to happen. If you want it bad enough, often you can convince yourself it's going to happen. I have, I just tell you, I have never bought a lot of a lottery ticket, and I don't intend on buying a lottery ticket. And that's not, you know, good for me. I'm a good boy. That's not that. I just my take on the whole lottery thing is, uh, if you're mathematically challenged, you'll play it because it makes absolutely no sense. Because there's no way in this world you're ever going to win. You have a greater chance. You guys are bald of uh, breaking up with a full head of hair tomorrow morning than you have of winning the lottery. You, you just do it. Yeah. And so go ahead and lay out your money and see what happens. It's not going to happen. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, just mathematically, you, you, you're not thinking very well if, if you're laying out and you just kind of open it. I, I get, oh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, is it fun to lose money, really? But, but for some people, that, that's, that's where we go. But it's amazing when it gets to be like this astronomical number out there, I don't know, 100 million. When, when, the, when the news cameras go and they talk to people going in to buy these things, these people, they're convinced. You ever seen that? Oh, I know I'm going to win. I know it. I just feel it. It's going to happen. Like, I've got the money spent already. And you go, what's going on? They have this incredible faith, trust, that they're going to be the next Powerball, super mega million, zillion stuff, and then here we go. They're they're living it now, and I would go, that's amazing. Because they don't they don't they don't win. Well, somebody's got to. I get it. I mean, I've known a few people. I've known a few people in my day that this won uh, uh, quite a lot. I go, okay, but basically it's. it's there's no mathematical chance that, that you're going to win. Uh, but they're convinced they are. Faith is not a way to get what we want from God. But you just have to believe. You just have to know that you know. No doubting allowed, but that will cancel the transaction. Uh, doubt is not faith. Doubt does not move God. So psychologically, get to the point where you doubt, don't doubt anymore, and that's the key. I know, I'm not going to doubt anymore, we just know this, and you, you kind of go in, in the, a, a different place in your mind, and, and while you're at it, get a few or a lot of other people to agree with you and to pray with you. Like, God may not hear your prayer alone, but if you get two or three more, or call the prayer hotline, or put an ad in the paper, or whatever you do, the more people we can get to pray, here's the thought, the more people we can get to pray, the more God is like, his arm is behind his back, and he has to, he doesn't have a choice anymore. Look at all the praying people. Now, if there were only 50, I might not. But now that you got 500, I, I guess I don't have a choice now. Really, is that how it works? And by the way, we don't really know what the number is, so God's not telling I go, would a loving God really put us in that sort of turmoil? Just get more and more and more and more and more and more. And if you get enough, and by the way, you don't know what the number is. And God said, well, all right. It's going to happen now. Or people misusing, oh, we're two or, two or more are gathered. There I am in their midst. Verse doesn't doesn't speak to this. Um, in the Bible, there, there you go. I go. Is really is that how it works? Faith helps us get what we want, trusting that Jesus will give us what we want if we believe it badly enough. That sounds a whole lot like mysticism and psychological manipulation, not biblical Christianity. If you believe that, a good chance at one point in your life, your faith will be shipwrecked. 
you will be disappointed with God. You may stop coming to church, or if you come, you don't really buy into it. You kind of know, but God doesn't move you anymore because He let you down before. He probably let you down again. So don't get your hopes up when it comes to God. Don't ask for too much. It's not that we don't ask God for stuff. We're told to. But I'll tell you what. God tells us no for reasons unknown to us quite often. A number of years ago, I go in another church in a galaxy far, far away. I was pastoring. And there was this man who had a 21-year-old daughter, and she had cancer. And this is the, back in the days uh, where a lot of church, in our church we had Wednesday night, you know, prayer and Bible study, and not many came, so we could sit like ten around the table, and that was that was kind of us. And so he would come all the time, and got to know him, and and so he said, "Listen, you know, this is what's going on with my daughter. She's dying, but I know she's not going to die." Because I have, I have faith. And he did, he had an, this incredible faith. And I'm going, wow. I know it's not going to happen. And I want you to pray with me. And I want you to agree with me. Because if, if, if anyone agrees with you, well then now it's, now it's a sure thing. So it's not just me. You're agreeing with me. What are we going to do? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to hit your daughter down. Yeah, we'll, we'll come along and we'll pray and agree with and, and, and those things. And guess what happened? You know, she died. And this guy had what you might call this crisis of a, he was this, his world was rocked. I don't know what ever happened, you know, to him. It wasn't much longer after that he left the church. And then I lost track of where he went from there. He did everything right. He had the code. I mean, if anyone was certain of something happening, it was him. He knew. I mean, there was no wavering there. No one could ever accuse him of having a lack of faith. He was a godly man. At one point, he started his own church. His 21-year-old daughter dies. And he, he's just, the way I put it, he's just sort of stumbling and staggering around after that. That was, that was like my take on his life. God seemed to let him down. I go, how could this be? I want to suggest that is not what faith is. It's not the assurance that God is going to do something just because you want to add it up. Let me give you an example of faith. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Faith Hall of Faith. And what Hebrews 11 does, it has time after time after time, it goes back to Old Testament saints. It says, by faith, so-and-so did this, and by faith they did that, and by faith, and by faith, and by faith, and by faith. And so if you want to know what faith is, you know, look, look at this chapter. We already defined it in, in verse 1, but so many of the other verses, it, it just spells out what faith is. And so I uh, can't go through all, but, but let me pick one person. His name is Moses. An example of, of his faith, and bear with me as I read a few verses, or you can read along with me. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to call the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering what allowed him to do that? He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Secondly, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the, of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. See there, yeah, there's two things. The first, what faith did, he, he allowed him to endure ill treatment. And the second part, it allowed him to endure the wrath of the king. He didn't fear it. 
So Moses' faith allowed him to suffer well and to not be afraid. That's what his faith did. His faith did not change the circumstances of his life. It didn't cause him now uh, to be in the good graces of, of Pharaoh. It didn't allow him to, or allow the, 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 the king to not pour out his wrath on him. To suffer well, he endured. What allowed him to endure? It says he looked to the reward. His faith was in the reward. The certainty was in the reward. I know, I know, God will reward me for not caving in, although it comes with consequences I would rather not experience. Who wants to suffer? I don't, you don't, yet be crazy to want that. Who wants life to be harder? I don't, you don't, we're trying to make life easier. But, fair, or, but the most of it, you know what? Even if life gets and remains harder, I'm going to stay the course because I know God has a reward for me. And it's not talking about that God will reward you in this world. That wasn't the point. It's not that God didn't do great things through Moses, but, but he knew that someday I'm going to get this reward. I know that. See, you can have that faith. Whatever's going on now, do you know how short life is? Anybody? You know how short life is? I used to remember, we're hardly here long enough to unpack. And the next thing you know, look at us. Not, for some of you, you know, I'm, I'm ancient. And you're kind of wondering, you know, how much longer will even be able to drive. Or, thanks. For a few others, I'm not that old. But I do tell you this. I have no idea how I got to be my age. I have no clue. In my mind, I'm still playing Little League Baseball. In my mind. In my mind, I'm still the catcher behind the plate. That's what I do. In my mind. I'm surprised I can just still do that. <laughs> I can also do some push-ups, but I'm not, you know, in my mind. And here I am. I don't, I don't get it. All I know is that it, at some point, life just accelerates. Time does. Before you know it, you know, you're, you're just, you're old, and you see it, you feel it, and, and you just know. You just know that uh, I don't have as much time left than I've already lived. I, 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 I know that. And, and begin to be okay with that. And so, you know what? I, 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 I had better have some rewards waiting for me. The tendency as you get older is to look in the rearview mirror of life more than you look out through the front of the windshield. Because life is back there. My best days are back there. I get out the photo album sometimes. I go down memory lane way too much. And not that there isn't something about that, but I ought to be looking forward more than I'm looking backwards. And for Moses, I'm looking forward because I know there's these rewards. I know that. I don't have them now, but I know that's his faith. The other part that allowed him to endure, to not be afraid, he endured by, by looking and seeing the invisible God. That's what it says. As seeing him who is unseen. Meaning, I can't see him physically, but I can see him spiritually. I can see him with I see God. I see Jesus. It's not what Jesus is going to do for me, but him and his character is enough. See, sometimes it comes down to this. Do I... Do I really love Jesus, or do I really love what Jesus can do for me? I mean, if you're in a relationship, uh, you need to love so-and-so more than what they can do for you, or it's not much of a relationship. And so what it means to, to love Jesus, to love God, to be able to see Him, 
even if he doesn't change my circumstances. See, Moses, Moses' faith resulted in endurance. It allowed him to suffer well, it allowed him to not be afraid when he shouldn't be afraid because he knew rewards were coming and he could see the unseen or the invisible God. It's, it's not that his, his suffering was going to cease, but that he would live well in hardship. That's what faith allows us to do. That's what it did in Moses' life. And that was all he needed. His faith did not result in external change of circumstances, but in internal strength resulting in endurance. That's what faith does. Now, does that mean it never changes external? I'm not, I'm not saying it never does, but don't don't land there. Don't bank on that. Beware of people. Well, I know that. Not based on what? Oh, I have a faith. Well, do not misplace your faith. Faith should do in us, as it did in Moses, allow you to endure, to suffer well, to not be afraid. That's what faith does. So I go faith in us. That was Moses. That was a long time ago, but should still be true. So there are a couple things here in Hebrews 11 concerning us. And that says, and without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe, that is, have faith, because faith and belief is the same word, must have faith that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you have faith that is true? Number one is faith pleases God. I would hope that everybody here, that's what you're going to do with your life. It's not about pleasing me or pleasing necessarily some other individual. It's about pleasing God. And then if you have to choose between pleasing a person or pleasing God, where are you going to go? You're going to go pleasing God. Well, so-and-so didn't like it. Well, I'm sorry about that, but not very sorry. But I would always rather please God than please someone if it displeases God. See, sometimes when we please God, we displease people. Sometimes we're going to please a person that displeases God. Where are you going to go? Well, please God. Faith pleases God. The second thing is, I go, faith bridges the God gap, meaning that all, all who come to Him must believe that He is. That's what I call the God gap. If you're going to come to him, you've got to believe, you have to have faith that he is. That he is what? That he is who he says he is. That he's alive, that he cares, that he loves, that he's powerful. And that he's active. He's not lethargic. He's close. He's not distant. He's here. And then faith results in reward. He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. That's the end of verse 6. He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. I'm amazed how quickly I cannot seek Him. You know, on Sunday morning, well, hey, yeah, we're all seeking him. How long, does it, how long does it take before you don't? How long does it take, to take before, you know, God has left the building, or God has left your mind, or, oh, oh that's, that's right, I mean, you're on into other stuff. He rewards those who seek him. And, and some of that reward's here, some of it. And I just say, you get a taste of God's reward on earth, just a taste just a little bit. But a taste, that doesn't really satisfy. I don't know about you, but the longer I'm alive on this earth, the more I'm not at ease with this earth. It's either the weirder it's getting, Can I put it? I don't belong down here. Fear of God, I don't belong down here. Or I'm getting tired of this place. 
It's just getting wackier. I don't understand. I, don't, I never really did, but even more, I don't understand it anymore. How people can think this and do that and be okay with it, say the stuff they do, do the things they do. I'm going, what, what, what's going on? Uh, I mean, God rewards me some here, just a taste. But when we leave here, it's not only just a taste. It's a buffet It is. I, I heard someone leaked out that there's this uh, like this cooker. If you look out, there's this cooker sitting down here. And and they're cooking. I'm just gonna tell you. Pork chops and ribs. Well, I plan on being around. <laughs> I, wasn't even, I wasn't even invited. But I have a way of showing up today. Some of you know that. And I'm going, it's not a little piece of it. This is a buffet banquet. That's how God rewards. Not drifts and drafts. Not where you're left wanting more. You can just take it on in. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. So seek him. things. Number one is a fact. This is the fact. God has not promised to deliver us from our circumstances, but he has promised to deliver us through our circumstances. That's his promise. There are times he may deliver us from our circumstances. That's not his promise. So don't let that shipwreck your faith. But he would deliver you through. I hope my friend, whose daughter died at the age of 21, has seen God deliver him through the circumstances. The last two are what I call our resolutions that I hope you take on. And that because of faith, life can't get hard enough to weaken or diminish my faith. We're not, we're not asking for a harder life. But it can't get hard enough. It's impossible to weaken or diminish my faith. And then the final one is this. Resolve. The harder life becomes, the stronger my faith becomes. And that is authentic and that is biblical faith. Faith resulting in endurance because we need endurance in order to live well. And may we all of us live well. Would you pray with me, Lord? Thank you for this thing called faith. It's, it's not some formula. It's not a code. It's not a key. You know? But it's a, it's a trusting in who you are and that there are rewards waiting for us. And that Lord, we are enough. And, and one day we will be ready on that back of the day. In the meantime, in the short meantime, may nothing diminish or stagger our faith. I pray for our Christ's name.